The Waif Woman A Cue from a Saga by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is a tale of Iceland, the Isle of Stories, and of a thing that befell in the year of the coming there of Christianity. In the spring of that year a ship sailed from the South Isles to traffic, and fell becalmed inside Snowfell Nest. The winds had speeded her, she was the first comer of the year, and the fishers drew alongside to hear the news of the south, and eager folk put out in boats to see the merchandise and make prices. From the doors of the hall on Frodis water the housefolk saw the ship becalmed, and the boats about her coming and going, and the merchants from the ship could see the smoke go up, and the men and women trooping to their meals in the hall. The good man of that house was called Finwood Keelfarer, and his wife Aud the light-minded, and they had a son, Eil, a likely boy, and a daughter Asdis, a slip of a maid. Finwood was well-to-do in his affairs, he kept open house and had good friends, but Aud his wife was not so much considered. Her mind was set on trifles, on bright clothing, and the admiration of men, and the envy of women, and it was thought she was not always so circumspect in her bearing as she might have been. But nothing to hurt. On the evening of the second day, men came to the house from sea. They told of the merchandise in the ship, which was well enough, and to be had at easy rates, and of a waif-woman that sailed in her, no one could tell why, and had chests of clothes beyond comparison, fine-coloured stuffs, finely woven, the best that ever came into that island, and gewgaws for a queen. At the hearing of that, Aud's eyes began to glisten. She went early to bed, and the day was not yet red, before she was on the beach, had a boat launched, and was pulling to the ship. By the way she looked closely at all boats, but there was no woman in any, and at that she was better pleased, for she had no fear of the men. When they came to the ship, boats were there already, and the merchants on the shore folk sat, and jested and chaffered in the stern. But in the forepart of the ship, the woman sat alone and looked before her sourly at the sea. They called her Thorgunna. She was as tall as a man and high in flesh, a buxom wife to look at. Her hair was of the dark red, time had not changed it. Her face was dark, the cheeks full, and the brow smooth. Some of the merchants told that she was sixty years of age, and others laughed and said she was but forty, but they spoke of her in whispers for they seemed to think that she was ill to deal with, and not more than ordinary canny. Aud went to where she sat, and made her welcome to Iceland. Thorgunna did the honours of the ship. So for a while they carried it on, praising and watching each other in the way of women. But Aud was a little vessel to contain a great longing, and presently the cry of her heart came out of her. The folk say, says she, you have the finest women's things that ever came to Iceland. And as she spoke, her eyes grew big. It would be strange if I had not, quoth Thorgunna. Queens have no finer. So Aud begged that she might see them. Thorgunna looked on her askance. Truly, said she, the things are for no use but to be shown. So she fetched a chest and opened it. Here was a cloak of the rare scarlet laid upon with silver beautiful beyond belief. Hard by was a silver brooch, a basket work that was wrought as fine as any shell, and was as broad as the face of the full moon. 
and Oud saw the clothes lying folded in the chest of all the colours of the day, and fire and precious gems, and her heart burned with envy. So, because she had so huge a mind to buy, she began to make light of the merchandise. "'They are good enough things,' says she, "'though I have better in my chest at home. It is a good enough cloak, and I am in need of a new cloak. At that she fingered the scarlet, and the touch of the fine stuff went to her mind like singing. Come, says she, if it were only for your civility in showing it, what will you have for your cloak? Woman, said Thorgunna, I am no merchant. And she closed the chest and locked it like one angry. Then Aud fell to protesting and caressing her. That was Aud's practice, for she thought if she hugged and kissed a person, none could say her nay. Next she went to flattery, said she knew the things were too noble for the like of her. They were made for a stately, beautiful woman like Thorgunna and at that she kissed her again, and Thulguna seemed a little pleased, and now Aud pled poverty and begged for the cloak and a gift, and now she vaunted the wealth of her good man, and offered ounces and ounces of fine silver, the price of three men's lives. Thulguna smiled, but it was a grim smile, and still she shook her head. At last Aud wrought herself into extremity and wept. I would give my soul for it, she cried. Fool, said Thorgunna, but there have been fools before you. And a little after she said this, Let us be dumb with beseeching, the things are mine. I was a fool to show you them, but where is their use unless we show them? Mine they are, and mine they shall be till I die. I have paid for them dear enough, said she. Aud saw it was of no avail, so she dried her tears, and asked Thorgunna about her voyage, and made believe to listen while she plotted in her little mind. Thorgunna, she asked presently, do you count kin with any folk in Iceland? I count kin with none, replied Thorgunna. My kin is of the greatest, but I have not been always lucky, so I say the less. So that you have no house to pass the time in, till the ship return, cries our dear Thorgunna. You must come and live with us. My good man is rich. His hand and his house are open, and I will cherish you like a daughter. At that, Thorgunna smiled on the one side, but her soul laughed within her at the woman's shallowness. I will pay her for that word, daughter, she thought, and she smiled again. I will live with you gladly, says she. For your house has a good name, and I have seen the smoke of your kitchen from the ship. But one thing you shall understand, I make no presents, I give nothing where I go, not a rag and not an ounce. Where I stay I work for my upkeep, and as I am strong as a man and hardy as an ox, they that have had the keeping of me were the better pleased. It was a hard job for Aud to keep her countenance, for she was like to have wept, and yet she felt it would be unseemly to eat her invitation, and like a shallow woman, and one that had always led her husband by the nose, she told herself she would find some means to cajole Thorgana, and come by her purpose after all. So she put a good face on the thing, had Thorgana into the house, her and her two great chests, and brought her home with her to the hall by the beach. All the way in she made much of the wife, and when they were arrived gave her a locked bed-place in the hall, where was a bed, a table, and a stool, 
and space for the two chests. "'This shall be yours while you stay here,' said Aud, and she attended on her guest. Now Thorgunna opened the second chest, and took out her bedding, sheets of English linen, the like of it never seen, a cover of quilted silk and curtains of purple wrought with silver. At the sight of these, Aud was like one distracted, greed blinded her mind, the cry rose strong in her throat, it must out. What will you sell your bedding for? she cried, and her cheeks were hot. Thorgunna looked upon her with a dusky countenance. "'Truly you are a courteous hostess,' said she. "'But I will not sleep on straw for your amusement.' At that Aud's two ears grew hot as her cheeks, and she took Thorgunna at her word, and left her from that time in peace. The woman was as good as her spoken word, Inside the house and out she wrought like three, and all that she put her hand to was well done. When she milked, the cows yielded beyond custom. When she made hay, it was always dry weather. When she took her turn at the cooking, the folk licked their spoons. Her manners, when she pleased, were outside imitation like one that had sat with kings in their high buildings. It seemed she was pious, too, and the day never passed, but she was in the church there, praying. The rest was not so well. She was of few words, and never one about her kin and fortunes. Gloom sat on her brow, and she was ill to cross. Behind her back they gave her the name of the waif-woman, or the wind-wife, to her face it must always be Thorgunna, and if any of the young men called her mother, she would speak no more that day, but sit apart in the hall and mutter with her lips. "'This is a queer piece of goods that we have gotten,' says Finwood Keelfarer. "'I wish we get no harm by her, but the good wife's pleasure must be done,' said he which was his common word. When she was at work, Thorgunna wore the rudest of plain clothes, though ever clean as a cat. But at night in the hall she was more dainty, for she loved to be admired. No doubt she made herself look well, and many thought she was a comely woman still and to those she was always favourable and full of pleasant speech. But the more that some pleased her, it was thought by good judges that they pleased Aud the less. When midsummer was past, a company of young men upon a journey came to the house by Frodis Water. That was always a great day for Aud when there were gallants at table. And what made this day the greater, Alf of the Fells was in the company, and she thought Alf fancied her. So, be sure, Aud wore her best. But when Thorgunna came from the bed-place, she was arrayed like any queen, and the broad brooch was in her bosom. All night in the hall, these women strove with each other, and the little maid Asdis looked on and was ashamed, and knew not why. But Thorgunna pleased beyond all. She told of strange things that had befallen in the world. When she pleased, she had the cue to laughter. She sang and her voice was full, and her songs new in that island, and whenever she turned, the eyes shone in her face, and the brooch glittered at her bosom, so that the young men forgot the word of the merchants as to the woman's age. 
and their looks followed her all night. Oud was sick with envy. Sleep fled her. Her husband slept, but she sat upright beside him in the bed and gnawed her fingers. Now she began to hate Thorgunna, and the glittering of the great brooch stood before her in the dark. Sure, she thought, it must be the glamour of that brooch. She is not so fair as I. She is as old as the dead in the hillside, and as for her wit and her songs, it is little I think of them. Up she got at that, took a light from the embers, and came to her guest's bed-place. The door was locked but Oud had a master key and could go in. Inside the chests were open, and in the top of one the light of her taper shone upon the glittering of the brooch. As a dog snatches food, she snatched it, and turned to the bed. Thorgunna lay on her side. It was to be thought she slept, but she talked the while to herself, and her lips moved. It seemed her years returned to her in slumber, for her face was grey and her brow knotted, and the open eyes of her stared in the eyes of Aud. The heart of the foolish woman died in her bosom, but her greed was the stronger, and she fled with that which she had stolen. When she was back in bed, the word of Thorgunna came to her mind that these things were for no use but to be shown. Here she had the brooch and the shame of it, and might not wear it. So all night she quaked with the fear of discovery, and wept tears of rage, that she should have sinned in vain. Day came, and Aud must rise, but she went about the house like a crazy woman. She saw the eyes of Asdis rest on her strangely, and at that she beat the maid. She scolded the housefolk, and by her way of it nothing was done aright. First she was loving to her husband, and made much of him, thinking to be on his good side when trouble came. Then she took a better way, picked a feud with him, and railed on the poor man till his ears rang, so that he might be in the wrong beforehand. The brooch she hid without, in the side of a hayrick, all this while Thorgunna lay in the bed-place which was not her way, for by custom she was early astir. At last she came forth, and there was that in her face that made all the house look one at the other, and the heart of Aud to be straightened. Never a word the guest spoke, not a bite she swallowed, and they saw the strong shudderings take and shake her in her place. Yet a little and still without speech, back she went into her bed-place, and the door was shut. "'That is a sick wife,' said Finwood. "'Her weird has come on her.' And at that the heart of Aud was lifted up with hope. All day Thorgana lay on her bed, and the next day sent for Finwood. Finwood Keelfarer, said she, my trouble is come upon me, and I am at the end of my days. He made the customary talk. I have had my good things. Now my hour is come, and let suffice, quoth she. I did not send for you to hear your prating. Finwood knew not what to answer for he saw her soul was dark. "'I sent for you on needful matters,' she began again. "'I die here, I, in this black house, in a bleak island, far from all decency and proper ways of man, and now my treasure must be left. Small pleasure have I had of it, and leave it with the less,' cried she. "'Good woman!' as the saying is, needs must, says Finwood, for he was nettled with that speech. For that I called you, quoth Thorgana, 
in these two chests are much wealth and things greatly to be desired i wish my body to be laid in scalaholt in the new church where i trust to hear the mass priest singing over my head so long as time endures to that church i will you to give what is sufficient leaving your conscience judge of it my scarlet cloak with the silver i will to that poor fool your wife she longed for it so bitterly i may not even now deny her give her the brooch as well i warn you of her i was such as she only wiser i warn you the ground she stands upon is water and whoso trusts her leans on rottenness i hate her and i pity her when she comes to lie where i lie there she broke off the rest of my goods i leave to your black-eyed maid young asdis for her slim body and clean mind only the things of my bed you shall see burned it is well said finwood it may be well quoth she if you obey my life has been a wonder to all and a fear to many while i lived none thwarted me and prospered see to it that none thwart me after i am dead it stands upon your safety it stands upon my honour quoth finwood and i have the name of an honourable man you have the name of a weak one says thorgana look to it look to it finwood your house shall rue it else the roof-tree of my house is my word said finwood and that is a true saying says the woman see to it then the speech of thorgunna is ended with that she turned her face against the wall and finwood left her the same night in the small hours of the clock thorgunna passed it was a wild night for summer and the wind sang about the eaves and clouds covered the moon when the dark woman wended from that day to this no man has learned her story or her people's name but be sure the one was stormy and the other great she had come to that isle a waif woman on a ship then she flitted and no more remained of her but her heavy chests and her big body in the morning the housewomen streaked and dressed the corpse then came finwood and carried the sheets and curtains from the house and caused bill the fire upon the sands but Oud had an eye on her man's doings. And what is this that you are at? said she, so he told her. Burn the good sheet, she cried, and where would I be with my two hands? No troth, said Oud, not so long as your wife is above ground. Good wife, said Finwood, this is beyond your province. Here is my word pledged, and the woman dead I pledged it to so much the more am i bound let me be doing as i must good wife tilly valley says she and a fiddlestick's end good man you may know well about fishing and be good at shearing sheep for what i know but you're little of a judge of damask sheets and the best word i can say is just this she says laying hold of one end of the goods that if you are made up to burn the plenishing you must burn your wife along with it i trust it will not go so hard says finwood and i beg you not to speak so loud and let the housefolk hear you let them speak low that are ashamed cries oud i speak only in reason you are to consider that the woman died in my house 
says Fenwood, and this was her last behest. In truth, good wife, if I were to fail, it is a thing that would stick long in my throat, and would give us an ill name with the neighbours. And you are to consider, says she, that I am your true wife, and worth all the witches ever burnt, and loving her old husband. Here she put her arms about his neck, and you are to consider that what you wish to do is to destroy fine stuff such as we have no means of replacing and that she bade you do it singly to spite me for i sought to buy this bedding from her while she was alive at her own price and that she hated me because i was young and handsome that is a true word that she hated you for she said so herself before she wended says Pinwood so that here is an old faggot that hated me and she dead as a bucket says ard and here is a young wife that loves you dear and is alive forby and at that she kissed him and the point is which are you to do the will of the man's weakness caught him hard and he faltered i fear some hurt will come of it said he there she cut in and bade the lads tread out the fire, and the lasses roll the bedstuff up and carry it within. My dear, says he, my honour, this is against my honour. But she took his arm under hers, and caressed his hand, and kissed his knuckles, and led him down the bay. Bobble, 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 says she, imitating him like a baby though she was none so young bubble bubble and a silly old man we must bury the troll wife and here is trouble enough and a vengeance horses will sweat for it before she comes to scalaholt tis my belief she was a man in a woman's habit and so now have done good man and let us get her waked and buried which is more than she deserves or her old duds are like to pay for and when that is ended we can consult upon the rest so finwood was but too well pleased to put it off the next day they set forth early for scalahalt across the heaths it was heavy weather and grey overhead the horses sweated and neighed and the men went silent for it was nowhere in their minds that the dead wife was canny only oud talked by the way like a silly seagull piping on a cliff and the rest held their peace the sun went down before they were across white water and the black night fell on them this side of netherness at netherness they beat upon the door the good man was not a bed nor any of his folk but sat in the hall talking and to them finwood made clear his business i will never deny you a roof said the good man of netherness but i have no food ready and if you cannot be doing without meat you must e'en fare farther they laid the body in a shed made fast their horses and came into the house and the door was closed again so there they sat about the lights and there was little said for they were none so well pleased with their reception presently in the place where the food was kept began a clattering of dishes and it fell to a bondman of the house to go and see what made the clatter he was no sooner gone than he was back again and told it was a big buxom woman high in flesh and naked as she was born setting meats upon a dresser Finwood grew pale as the dawn. He got to his feet, and the rest rose with him, and all the party of the funeral came to the buttery door. And the dead Thorgunna took no heed of their coming, but went on setting forth meats, and seemed to talk with herself as she did so, and she was naked to the buff. Great fear fell upon them, the marrow of their back grew cold. Not one word they spoke, neither good nor bad, but back into the hall and down upon their bended knees and to their prayers. 
Now in the name of God, what ails you? cried the good man of Netherness. And when they had told him, shame fell upon him for his churlishness. The dead wife reproves me, said the honest man. And he blessed himself and his house, and caused spread the tables, and they all ate of the meats that the dead wife laid out. This was the first walking of Thorgunna, and it is thought by good judges it would have been the last as well, if men had been more wise. The next day they came to Scalaholt, and there was the body buried, and the next after they set out for home. Finwood's heart was heavy and his mind divided. He feared the dead wife and the living, he feared dishonour and he feared dispeace, and his mind was like a seagull in the wind. Now he cleared his throat and made as if to speak, and at that hour cocked her eye and looked at the good man mocking, and his voice died unborn. At the last shame gave him courage. Oud, said he, yon was a most uncanny thing at Netherness. No doubt, said Oud. I have never had it in my mind, said he, that yon woman was the thing she should be. I dare say not, said Oud. I never thought so either. It stands beyond question she was more than canny, says Finwood, shaking his head. No manner of doubt but what she was ancient of mind. She was getting pretty old in body too, says Oud. Wife, says he, it comes in upon me strongly this is no kind of woman to disobey, above all being dead and her walking. I think, wife, we must even do as she commanded. Now what is ever your word, says she, riding up close and setting her hand upon his shoulder. The good wife's pleasure must be done. Is not that my Finwood? The good God knows I grudge you nothing, cried Finwood. "'But my blood runs cold upon this business. "'Worse will come of it,' he cried. "'Worse will flow from it.' "'What is this to do?' cries Oud. "'Here is an old brimstone hag "'that should have been stoned with stones "'and hated me besides. "'Vainly she tried to frighten me when she was living. "'Shall she frighten me now when she is dead and rotten? "'I trow not. Think shame to your beard, good man. Now these are man's shoes I see you shaking in, when your wife rides by your bridal hand as bold as nails. Ay, ay, quoth Finwood, but there goes a byword in the country, little wit, little fear. At this hour it began to be concerned, for he was usually easier to lead. So now she tried the other method on the man. "'Is that your word?' cried she. "'I kiss the hands of ye. "'If I have not wit enough, I can rid you of my company. "'Wit is it, he seeks,' she cried. "'The old broomstick that we buried yesterday had wit for you.' So she rode on ahead, and looked not the road that he was on. Poor Finwood followed on his horse, but the light of the day was gone out, for his wife was like his life to him. He went six miles and was true to his heart, but the seventh was not half through when he rode up to her. "'Is it to be the good wife's pleasure?' she asked. "'Oh, you shall have your way,' says he. "'God grant there come no ill of it.' So she made much of him and his heart was comforted. When they came to the house, Aud had the two chests to her own bed-place, and gloated all night on what she found. Finwood looked on, and trouble darkened his mind. Wipe, says he at last, you will not forget these things belong to Asdis. At that she barked upon him like a dog. Am I a thief? she cried. 
the brat shall have them in her turn when she grows up. Would you have me give her them now to turn a minx's head with? So the weak man went his way out of the house in sorrow, and fell to his affairs. Those that wrought with him that day observed that now he would labour and toil like a man furious, and now would sit and stare like one stupid, for in truth he judged the business would end ill. For a while there was no more done, and no more said. Aud cherished her treasures by herself, and none was the wiser except Finwood. Only the cloak she sometimes wore, for that was hers by the will of the dead wife, but the others she let lie, because she knew she had them foully, and she feared Finwood somewhat, and Thorgunna much. At last husband and wife were bound to bed one night, and he was the first stripped and got in. What sheets are these? he screamed as his legs touched them, for these were smooth as water, but the sheets of Iceland were like sacking. Clean sheets, I suppose, says Aud, but her hand quavered as she wound her hair. Woman, cried Finwood, these are the bedsheets of Thorgunna, these are the sheets she died in. Do not lie to me. At that hour turned and looked at him. Well, says she, they have been washed. Finwood lay down again in the bed between Thorgunna's sheets and groaned. Never a word more, he said, for now he knew he was a coward and a man dishonoured. Presently his wife came beside him, and they lay still, but neither slept. It might be twelve in the night, when Aud felt Finwood shudder so strong that the bed shook. "'What ails you?' said she. "'I know not,' he said. "'It is a chill like the chill of death. My soul is sick with it.' His voice fell low. "'It was so Thorgunna sickened,' said he. And he rose and walked in the hall in the dark till it came morning. Early in the morning he went forth to the sea-fishing with four lads. Aud was troubled at heart and watched him from the door, and even as he went down the beach, she saw him shaken with the gunner's shudder. It was a rough day, the sea was wild, the boat laboured exceedingly, and it may be that Finwood's mind was troubled with his sickness. Certain it is that they struck, and their boat was burst upon a scurry under Snowfellness. The four lads were spilled into the sea, and the sea broke and buried them. But Finwood was cast upon the skerry, and clambered up, and sat there all day long, God knows his thoughts. The sun was halfway down, when a shepherd went by on the cliffs about his business, and spied a man in the midst of the breach of the loud seas, upon a pinnacle of reef. He hailed him, and the man turned and hailed again. There was in that cove so great a clashing of the seas, and so shrill a cry of sea-fowl, that the herd might hear the voice and not the words. But the name Thorgunna came to him, and he saw the face of Finwood Keelfarer, like the face of an old man. Lively ran the herd to Finwood's house, and when his tale was told there, Eyolf the boy was lively to out a boat and hasten to his father's aid. By the strength of hands they drove the keel against the seas, and with skill and courage Eyolf won upon the skerry and climbed up. There sat his father dead, and this was the first vengeance of Thorgunna against broken faith. It was a sore job to get the corpse on board, and a sorer yet to bring it home before the rolling seas. But the lad Eyolf was a lad of promise and the lads that pulled for him were sturdy men. So the Breakfaith's body was got home, and waked, and buried on the hill. Aud was a good widow, and wept much, for she liked Finwood well enough. Yet a bird sang in her ears that now she might marry a young man. Little fear that she might have her choice of them, she thought, with all Thorgunna's fine things, and her heart was cheered. Now, when the corpse was laid in the hill, 
as dis came where out sat solitary in hall and stood by her a while without speech well child says oud and again well and then keep us holy if you have anything to say out with it so the maid came so much nearer mother says she i wish you would not wear these things that were thorgunna's ah cries oud this is what it is you begin early brat and who has been poisoning your mind your fool of a father i suppose and then she stopped and went all scarlet who told you they were yours she asked again taking it all the higher for her stumble when you are grown then you shall have your share and not a day before these things are not for babies the child looked up at her and was amazed i do not wish them she said i wish they might be burned upon my word what next cried oud and why should they be burned i know my father tried to burn these things said asdis and he named thorgunna's name upon the skerry ere he died and oh mother i doubt they have brought ill luck but the more oud was terrified the more she would make light of it then the girl put her hand upon her mother's i fear they are ill come by said she the blood sprang in oud's face and who made you a judge upon your mother that bore you cried she kinswoman said asdis looking down i saw you with the brooch what do you mean when where did you see me cried the mother here in the hall said asdis looking on the floor the night you stole it at that oud let out a cry then she heaved up her hand to strike the child you little spy she cried then she covered her face and wept and rocked herself what can you know she cried how can you understand that are a baby not so long weaned he could your father could the dear good man dead and gone he could understand and pity he was good to me now he has left me alone with heartless children as does she cried have you no nature in your blood you do not know what i have done and suffered for them i have done oh and i could have done anything and there is your father dead and after all you ask me not to use them no woman in iceland has the like and you wish me to destroy them not if the dead should rise she cried no no and she stopped her ears not if the dead should rise and let that end it so she ran into her bed-place and clapped at the door and left the child amazed but for all out spoke with so much passion it was noticed that for long she left the things unused only she would be locked some while daily in her bed-place where she pored on them and secretly wore them for her pleasure now winter was at hand the days grew short and the nights long and under the golden face of morning the isle would stand silver with frost word came from holyfell to frodis water of a company of young men upon a journey that night they supped at holyfell the next it would be at frodis water and alf of the fells was there and thong brand kettleson and hall the fair oud went early to her bed-place and there she poured upon these fineries till her heart was melted with self-love there was a kirtle of a mingled colour and the blue shot into the green and the green lightened from the blue as the colours play in the ocean between deeps and shallows she thought she could endure to live no longer and not wear it there was a bracelet of an ell long wrought like a serpent and with fiery jewels for the eyes she saw it shine on her white arm and her head grew dizzy with desire ah she thought never were fine lendings better met with a fair wearer and she closed her eyelids 
and she thought she saw herself among the company and the men's eyes go after her admiring with that she considered that she must soon marry one of them and wondered which and she thought alf was perhaps the best or all the fair but was not certain and then she remembered finwood keelfarer in his can upon the hill and was concerned well he was a good husband to me she thought and i was a good wife to him but that is an old song now so she turned again to handling the stuffs and jewels at last she got to bed in the smooth sheets and lay and fancied how she would look and admired herself and saw others admire her and told herself stories till her heart grew warm and she chuckled to herself between the sheets so she shook a while with laughter and then the mirth abated but not the shaking and grew to cold upon her flesh and the cold of the grave upon her belly and the terror of death upon her soul with that a voice was in her ears it was so thorgona sicken thrice in the night the chill and the terror took her and thrice it passed away and when she rose on the morrow death had breathed upon her countenance she saw the house-folk and her children gaze upon her well she knew why she knew her day was come and the last of her days and her last hour was at her back and it was so in her soul that she scarce minded all was lost all was past mending she would carry on until she fell so she went as usual and hurried the feast for the young man and railed upon her housefolk but her feet stumbled and her voice was strange in her own ears and the eyes of the folk fled before her at times too the chill took her and the fear along with it and she must sit down and the teeth beat together in her head and the stool tottered on the floor at these times she thought she was passing and the voice of thorgunna sounded in her ear the things are for no use but to be shown it said oud oud have you shown them once no not once and at the sting of the thought her courage and strength would revive and she would rise again and move about her business now the hour drew near and oud went to her bed-place and did on the bravest of her finery and came forth to greet her guests was never woman in iceland robed as she was the words of greeting were yet between her lips when the shuddering fell upon her strongest labour and a horror as deep as hell her face was changed amidst her finery and the faces of her guests were changed as they beheld her fear puckered their brows fear drew back their feet and she took her doom from the looks of them and fled to her bed-place there she flung herself on the wife's coverlet and turned her face against the wall that was the end of all the words of oud and in the small hours on the clock her spirit wended asdis had come to and fro seeing if she might help where was no help possible of man or woman it was light in the bed-place when the maid returned for a taper stood upon a chest there lay oud in her fine clothes and there by her side on the bed the big dead wife thorgunna squatted on her hams no sound was heard but it seemed by the movement of her mouth as if thorgunna sang and she waved her arms as if to singing god be good to us cried asta she is dead dead said the dead wife is the weird past cried asdis when the sin is done the weird is dreed said thorgunna and with that she was not 
but the next day Eyolf and Asdis caused build a fire on the shore betwixt tide marks. There they burned the bedclothes and the clothes and the jewels and the very boards of the waif woman's chests, and when the tide returned it washed away their ashes. So the weird of Thulgunna was lifted from the house on Frodish water. End of the Waif Woman by Robert Louis Stevenson